Vikes Now. I am Dustin Baker. I'm here with Josh Fry. Today is the November 30th edition. We got a few hours left the month of November before we go into full Christmas mode. And bada bing, the Vikings are nine and two. Every week we sign off, sir. We talk about potentially talking about eight and three team or nine and two or, or, and so forth. But we got the nine and two version. So I got to ask you out of the gate. Thanks for joining us again on this Wednesday. What was the deal with Mac Jones? looking like Tom Brady, and how impressive was it to topple a Belichick team without Brady? Well, to answer the Mac Jones question, I think the <laughs> biggest reason is just this this defense is just not healthy right now. Uh, we had Duke Shelley starting for the first time this year after being on the practice squad for most of the season. Andrew Booth missed the game. Cam Dantzler still on IR. Caleb Evans still dealing with his concussion. So we're down to our basically fifth-string cornerback at this point. So it makes sense that Bill Belichick's defense would try to attack that mismatch as much as possible. So I think that's more to do well with what happened with Mac Jones more than anything else. Um, then you throw in Dalvin Tomlinson missing another game and just this team coming off their third game in 12 days. Defense is probably super banged up even around the even around the parts where we're not even paying attention to right now. So I think that's basically what it comes down to with Mac Jones. I'm not super concerned about it, but beating a Belichick team uh, with them uh, on a short week, uh, there, I think I read a stat. Bill Belichick going into that game was thirteen and one and one straight up and against the spread in games Ooh. coming off short weeks. Really? So the fact that they were able to do that is just that's a that's incredible. That's that's an incredible performance against one of the best passing defenses in the entire league. Kirk Cousins had probably one of his best games of the entire season, maybe of his career even. <laughs> um, and I, th- I, I was it was just a really impressive game all around. So. Yeah, looking, look, loving that and just looking forward to the Jets this week now. <laughs> I think one of the, I don't know if it's overused, but popular slogans is that Belichick makes teams play left-handed. Well, the Vikings yeah. won this game very right-handed with Jefferson just down their throats, like nothing you could do to stop it. Uh, so I, I think that was somewhat noteworthy. And then on uh, Cousins, I think it would probably be a top fiver of his career only because it was in prime time and the narrative used to weaponize against him says that he's incapable of winning at prime time. Uh, even though I've said many times he isn't quite as good in prime time that he is at normal time, but the world will tell you that he's horrendous at night and it's yeah. flat out false. And so I've never been able to understand that. Uh, I think it just comes down to the quarterback record crowd and God love them. Um, but uh, the Patriots, so they head to six and five. They're on the outside looking in, although I believe they have a tiebreaker on the Jets, who the Vikings play. We'll get to that in a little bit. Oh, let's see. So Dalvin Tomlinson, I want to tell you a little, a very quick, funny story about him. So hopefully he's back on Sunday. But I was talking with uh, Yannick Eckhart from Germany, who writes for Vikings territory about him, just casual on our Slack channel. And if you pull up his PFF game by game log, it's like every game is like 73, 75, 74, 72. So Yannick's theory is that PFF is like, we're not even going to watch the tape. We're just going to pick something between 73 because we know he's that good. Or he's just the same guy. He's not elite, but he's good. And so it's it's so consistent. And that means he's the quintessential space eater for the Vikings, even though they didn't use him as nose tackle last year, at least on the depth chart. So do you think that when he comes back, that also, I mean, he's not an intense pass rusher, but what does he do that can help the Vikings defense overall, assuming he's back in week 13? Well, I think he's just, he's just another body that the offensive line has to worry about. And right now they just, they haven't really had to do that other than Daniel Hunter, Zadarius Smith. If you can find a way to stop those two guys, you're probably good in terms mm-hmm. of a pass rush because the, the, the interior defensive line for the Vikings has not been very good in terms of pass rush so far this season, but Dalvin Tomlinson being there, that opens things up a little bit. And maybe we see a little bit more of some of those bigger performances that we saw, like against Miami from Zadarius Smith, where he's just being able to get to the quarterback at will. And he's, he's able to be that all pro guy that we, we kind of have seen throughout the early part of the year. And it's kind of died off a little bit since Dalvin Tomlinson went down, but and and then in terms of run defense, he's he's one of the better guys that you can ask for to have on that defensive line. And the Vikings run defense has been pretty decent even without him. So that's a good sign, too. But having him back, I think that does a lot. Uh, just like I said, another body, just another body to get out there and open up some space for some of the other guys. When I hear the the dialogue, the frustrated dialogue that says that this defense besides the fourth quarter, really isn't that much different from last year. It is via rush defense. I remember last year, I think I told you once or twice that I used to like 
applaud when they only allowed four or five yards. That's how nauseating it got to be towards the end of the Zimmer era, which is very odd. And on your point about interior pass rush, this is why myself and others banged the drum for Indomit and Sue for about five months is because we got Bullard, Harrison Phillips, and Tomlinson, and none of those guys are known for excessive pass rush. So even like Sheldon Richardson, it's probably too late in the game to give him a call, but there's a reason why there's not much pass rush up the middle is because they don't have specialists to rush the passer. It's, it's a, a run defense middle. And I suppose that's how it goes. What did the, so we got Vikings got their teeth kicked in, lost by 37 points to the Cowboys in a pseudo prime time. It was in the, the 325 slot two weeks ago. And they, we talked about how they needed to rebound hell or high water, either win by one point or win by 50 points. They won by seven. And your enthusiasm on Super Bowl contendership didn't seem to dip too much after the Cowboys. But what what happened to your opinion of the rest of the way outlook because they took care of business in you know four days worth of rest? Um, again, it doesn't really change all that much. I think this team has shown that when everything is right for them, uh, they can they can compete with the best teams in the entire league. Like I said, Patriots pass defense going into that game was number one in a lot of categories yeah. uh, so the fact that Kirk Cousins was able to go out there Justin Jefferson had the type of game that he had and they weren't able to slow him down just shows the kind of connection that those two have had all season long and it's it's a special one so that's going to be a problem for any team going into the playoffs and if they can continue to just feed that connection kind of Cooper Cup-ish like the <laughs> Rams did last year I, I I think this team is capable of going really far no, no matter how bad this defense is, is during the first three quarters of a game. <laughs> and it's so mind-boggling that they can suddenly decide to get good in the fourth quarter. I don't understand what the hubris is. That like, all right, do they look around? Or does Ed Donatel like say, go? Or like, why can't you do that in the first two and a half hours? I do not understand it. Um, do you have any theories? I, I think one of it is they – they don't give up the same like if you if you watch them throughout the first three quarters of the game, they're they're pretty content allowing teams to pass for like seven, eight yards a clip, which is kind of how Mac Jones piled up a lot yeah. of his numbers throughout Thursday night. Um, and then in that fourth quarter, I think they they do dial it up a little bit with a little bit more press coverage. They dial up a few more of those creative blitzes that we like to see with Smith and Hunter on the field. Um, so I think that plays a role. And then just the fact that you have a lot of veteran guys that have been in a lot of these situations where you need to make a play and they're able to go out and do it. Uh, Patrick Peterson has been one of the best corners in the entire league this year. <laughs> We've talked about that a lot. Even Harrison Smith, he's coming up with plays all the time, despite some of the lower numbers over the past couple of years than what we've seen in the past. So just the fact that these guys are veterans and they're, they've been in the moment before, I think, I think that plays a huge part in it too. Every, even if every the remaining six Vikings games are wins by 14 points or losses by 10 points, when we get to the playoffs, because it's it's coming for the Vikings, whether you like it or not, um, it's going to feel like, oh, this is old territory for the players and for the fans, because all of these wins minus the Packers week one feels like a miniature playoff game. Like there's I'm not saying that to hype the team or to you know promote Vikings ratings on television. It really like every game has the atmosphere like all right, well, yeah. got one possession, maybe two possessions left and they're down by 10. Can they do this? And then they do. So I think they're going to have a bunch of on the job training. So you talked about the, uh, you know, the, the metrics, the, the Vikings not being up there. And interestingly, on the 33rd team dot com where Rick Spielman writes and KJ Osborne contributes. And I think Zimmer even tells people stuff to write on there. Uh, Joe Banner, who was the general manager of the Philadelphia Eagles for 17 years, he was the the GM that guided them to the Super Bowl loss to the Patriots. He had a you know front and center article that said fraud a report, uh, and he, he said it was preposterous that the Vikings would be considered in the same territory as the Chiefs, Eagles, or Bills. And I get it from the outside, you like 32nd rank total total yards allowed defense. What type of shit is this? But is it is it fair to hit for him to call the Vikings preposterous or frauds? I mean, a lot of the numbers probably suggest it. Uh, I do think there's a little bit of bias in that, too, coming from a former Eagles GM saying that the Vikings aren't going to be in the same tier as the Eagles. So <laughs> I think that plays a little bit into that, too. But uh, yeah, some of the numbers, they they 
it doesn't make any sense that this team is nine and two a lot of the times. So, like yeah. they had the worst point differential of for any nine and two team in the entire NFL. So yeah, it it some of the, some of this doesn't make much sense. And if you're going to rely on analytics, you're probably like, yeah, this probably is a first round exit sort of team. But I think if you if you watch some of these games, the fact that they're able to lock things down in the fourth quarter. They're, they allow the fourth fewest points in the fourth quarter on defense, and then they score the most points on offense in the fourth quarter. And I think if come playoff time, that's the kind of team that you want. Like, it doesn't matter what happens as much to the first three quarters. If you can lock things down in a close game in the fourth, you're going to win a lot of those games. And I think the Vikings are capable of doing that. When when he let's, when he pits those metrics against one another, do you – so it, 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 it seems like, you know, you, you feel that they're, they're better than Joe Banner thinks. Do you think that the Vikings have a stretch in these last six games where they're going to turn on the jets and say, we're, we're done monkeying around. Or do you think that this is just the way it is? Because it almost feels like it should have changed by now. And I mean, for context, uh, football outsiders who does the DVOA metric calls the Vikings overall, the 22nd best team in the league. And by record, their second best. It's mind bending to think of that variance. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to a lot of these games being one possession, especially mm-hmm. if you look at like teams against like the Bears, even the even the Packers. Like they didn't they didn't knock the socks off of them as much as they probably should have in Week One, mm-hmm. um, or at least probably could have if they didn't slow things down in the second half. But I there's there's always room for improvement, and I think Kevin O'Connell is kind of attested to that throughout the entire season and i think we're starting to see some of the some of these things coming to fruition with some of the improvements he's kind of starting to unlock Kirk cousins a little bit more i think he's feeling a lot more uh it's a lot more natural for him i think in this in this passing in this passing game where he's a lot more aggressive than we've seen in years past especially throughout the entire game i think forcing some some of these balls he's forcing to justin jefferson have been <laughs> probably some throws that he considered to be ill-advised in the past uh past years of his career but yeah i think over these past six weeks you don't have a ton of super competitive teams i think the jets and the giants are the only two teams that you're going to play the rest of the way that are over 500 right now and i think the lions are the only team that have a offense that ranks in the top 15 in terms of points scored so yeah there's a world where they go into these final six weeks and they start knocking the socks off of some of these teams especially with some of the injuries that are going on, especially around the division. So yeah, there's a world where they, they get, they sort of get this thing back on track and even the anal- analytics might sort of suggest that this <laughs> is going to be one of the better teams down the stretch. Yeah, yeah. They should start to meet in the middle because if we're going to stare at a 14 and three team, for instance, that, you know, ranks 20th per team DVO- DVOA, I mean, it would be unprecedented. And the stat that you mentioned um, to extrapolate a little bit, uh, I ran the numbers again. I try to do it every week just for context that uh, through through 11 games in all of NFL history, teams that have at least nine wins, so the Vikings are included, they have the lowest point differential NFL history of any team ever with nine wins through 11 games. So to Joe Banner's point, yeah, the, the point differential shows fraud. Now, does it matter? I guess we will find out when it starts to hit the nitty gritty in January. One thing I'm dying to ask you, and we're going to get into the Jets now, is I kind of looked around last night and I was like, I haven't seen much hype about Sauce Gardner versus Justin Jefferson. Is this is that because he won't necessarily be assigned to him most of the game? Um, I'm I'm not even sure about that because, mm-hmm. like you, I haven't seen much hype around it either. And no. Sauce has been quietly one of the best corners in the entire league too. I think he's, I think he might be top five now in terms of PFF grade. Number so one, he's number one right yeah. now. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, there you go. So yeah, he's been one, he's been one of the best. So <laughs> I, yeah, I don't understand it either. I do think that if the Jets want to succeed in this game, they should, probably should just throw Sauce out there and say, here, go stop this guy. You want to be the number one corner in the league? Go do it. And he probably he probably could do a lot better job than most guys have done so far this year. So I I don't see any reason why they wouldn't do it. Um. So yeah, I I I'm kind of just as confused as you are about that. <laughs> yeah, I you know f- keeping my ears to the pavement at all times. I thought for sure that that this would be billed as Sauce versus Jay Jets, and it really hasn't. Like if you skim headline, skim ESPN, Bleacher Report, NFL.com, it's really not billed that way. And I'm starting to think that perhaps. Like if you look back at the Jets Bills game, um, Sauce ran with Diggs, but 
I mean, he was also a Gabriel Davis. So I don't know because yeah. he's a rookie, if they like to assign him to the other guy, which would be Thielen in this case. But yeah, it just seems like for two Titans of industry, cornerback wide receiver, that the matchup hasn't been sold to us. Like, like, you know, bird versus magic or Jordan versus bird. Like we haven't had that at all. And so I, I'm, I'm going to be very curious in the first drive or first couple of drives, if they match up or if this is how it goes, where the, there's a reason that it's not being preached. What's your general thought? It kind of, it's kind of weird that the jets feel a lot like the Patriots, great defense. The offense looked great last week, uh, but I don't know if Mike white is mania sustainable. It feels like a playing the Patriots without Belichick. Am I wrong there? Uh, I don't think so. I think Robert Sala is a pretty decent coach, though. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's definitely not as good as Belichick is, or he <laughs> doesn't have the sort of he doesn't have the pedigree that uh, Belichick does. But no, this is a, this is probably one of the bigger surprises of the entire NFL season: the fact that this is a seven and four squad. And I I think that I quietly think that this offense is a lot better with Mike White than they are with Zach Wilson. Um, especially he, I think he does a lot better job of getting some of their stars on offense, the ball, like Michael Carter has been great. He was, he had a great performance last week, uh, granted it's against the bears. So take it with a, take it with a grain of salt there, but I think he's done a great job of fulfilling, uh, a lot of the role that Brees Hall did early in the season. Um, and then I, I also think that Garrett Wilson, the fact that he has four TDs and all of them have come between Joe Flacco and Mike White, I think <laughs> I, that that doesn't that doesn't speak that doesn't speak great for uh, Zach Wilson moving forward. But Mike White, I think he does a great job of running this offense. This is a solid team. The Vikings need to be prepared, but I do think they're gonna I think they're gonna come away spoiler with a win in this one. <laughs> yeah, the the thing about Mike White is that folks forget or don't know that we did this last year, and I don't I don't I don't think yeah. it. Well, I I know that Wilson wasn't benched. I think he might have even still been hurt. But Mike White came in. Yeah, yeah, Mike White came in through for 400 yards, I think two or three touchdowns. And within a week and a half, he was back into a pumpkin through four picks against the Bills and nobody ever saw him again. And, you know, the legend of White Mike uh, was dead and now doing the same thing goes against the Bears defense without Roquan Smith or Robert Quinn because they decided to have a fire sale right when their offense got good. And so I'm but I also wasn't really last week. I wasn't convinced that Mac Jones was going to be all that. And, you know, he looked just like Brady, 382 yards, two touchdowns. And I'm still, I'll remain convinced, not that it matters, that if Brady would have been on that team, same result. That's how -hmm. how dynamic Wilson was enabled, uh, you know, to look. So uh, let's see, what other storylines there? You got Quentin Williams against Ed Ingram. He should dominate that. Tyler Conklin revenge game. Mike Rimmers doesn't really play, but he's a backup tackle guard. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's Kevin O'Connell spent the most time with any team of his career with the Jets, which was, I think, two off seasons, never saw the regular season filled. So it's an interesting game. And then somehow, not in our lifetimes, really, but the Vikings habitually suck against the Jets. They're three and eight uh, in, in yeah. all of those storylines. <clears throat> like, what are you most looking forward to in this game? I think I, I do think it comes down to. Is Sauce Gardner going to be the guy that guards Jefferson most of the game? Because Jefferson, he kind of quietly got shut down a little bit against uh, Benjamin St. Juice in Washington. Uh, the Eagles game wasn't a very good one for him. Even the Lions, he had Jeff Okuda on him for most of that game, and he didn't have his greatest day then either. So I do think it comes down to can Jefferson hang with – well, he's obviously capable of hanging, but is he going to take advantage of one of the better corners in the league? Mm-hmm. And if he does do that, I think if he goes for another – <laughs> buck 50 couple touchdowns i think that's a message for the rest of the league to to watch out that this team is is going to be it's coming it's coming for everybody in this league and they're going to have trouble stopping them yeah it would seem if that happens against sauce or whoever else they throw on them it seems that darius slay will have be the only kryptonite and yeah. you know he could have a date with him later late in january all right i got two things to ask you about one is very weird i'm gonna leave that towards the end i can't believe i'm even gonna ask it but this one because the vikings match number is two we both believe the vikings will be triumphant on sunday who do you like in lions jaguars in detroit i think i like the jaguars in this yeah. one i don't i'm not trying to be too biased about it but uh, trevor lawrence started showing some things last week in that comeback it was such victory. a moment for him yeah, no, it was a it was a great moment. And I think we're going to look back on that as kind of that's going to be the coming out party, I yep. think, for Trevor Lawrence moving forward. Because, yeah, Jacksonville, it's it was so weird seeing that team 
be the one to overcome a fourth quarter deficit because so many times throughout their history, it's just been, they've been on the other side of that. Even in the AFC championship game against the Patriots, they <laughs> found a way to screw it up in the final couple minutes there. So yeah, I think, I do think that Jacksonville has a really decent chance of this one. And if they go on a run down the stretch of the season, I don't know, keep an eye on them in the wild card even. All right. This is going to be the weirdest thing you're asked all week, and you won't okay. believe it's coming from my lips. Um, but in the event that the rest of these six games don't go so peachy for the Vikings or they get to the wild card round and the Seahawks beat them 30 to nothing at home, something crazy, obscene like that. And all of a sudden, the Kirk Cousins uh, enthusiasm dampens fan wide, organization wide, if that were to happen, would you, and this is I'm going to do my office space. Believe me, it's a hypothetical. Would you have any interest for the Vikings in either one of the Wilson brothers, Russell Wilson or Zach Wilson, via trade, if either one of those guys was available for a cheap third rounder or something like that? Absolutely not. <laughs> Zero interest. <laughs> I, I've i read too much about Russell Wilson losing the locker room in Denver. I don't think that's a great fit at all. And then Zach Wilson, I, I, I didn't like him coming out of the draft. I, I was – confused why he was being hyped up as the number two overall pick the entire offseason and then it actually happened yeah um so i i i don't think i'd do it for either one of those guys i don't i russell wilson maybe you take a look at it but that contract is so big yeah. and he has not been good this year uh even even without nathaniel hackett being there to screw up some of the game management situations. <laughs> I, it, it's just, it's just been an entire shit show in Denver all season long. So I don't think I, I don't think I'd go after either one of those because right now, Kirk cousins, even if he was playing at like 80% of what he is right now, he's better than both of those guys by far. And it's so, so weird to hear that out loud and have it be absolute fact, because my yeah. goodness, a year and a half ago, two years ago, Russell Wilson was like 70 times better than cousins. And we felt it in our bones. Every time we yeah. watched Viking Seahawks, we knew fourth quarter Russell is going to lead them to victory. So I can't figure out for the life of me, if he's one of those few dudes that hit his mid thirties, not few dudes, one of the old school type dudes like Donovan McNabb who hit his mid thirties and stunk. I mean, I it's, it seems like that's obsolete, but I can't figure it out because nothing will ever change my mind that he was wonderful in Seattle. So either he got bad really quick. Nathaniel Hackett is the, the one of like Joe Banner said a fraud, uh, you know, just doesn't know how to do anything uh, because this wasn't like some Russell Wilson dude who had a couple good seasons. He was wonderful for a decade. And uh, I, I only thought of that because if you start spitballing with the Broncos and this isn't Broncos now, but they either have to fire Hackett, find a coach that can make Russ tick, fire George Payton, and then the new guy, the, the Walmarters will pick a new guy and find a way to trade Russell Wilson even with the exorbitant dead cap thing and start over or you run it back or you keep hack it and bench Russell and then draft a rookie with your second round. Like there's it's, it's so nasty. Everything yeah, about mean, the Broncos I, right now. I, I have absolutely no way to fix the Broncos. I, I don't know. Everything about them has just been so bad this year. I mean, you could, you can Except point to anyone Except for the defense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the defense has been the defense has been wonderful. Don't change anything there. Um, but yeah, this offense has been it's been horrendous. I, and there, you can point to any one of these things, and it it's part of the problem, but it's not the entire problem either. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's any one thing that you can do, and you're like, oh, this is going to be much better in 2023, where this is going to be like, oh, they're going to go back to the Super Bowl contender. They're going to go like 13 and four or anything like that. I I think at best with Russell Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett. If everything goes right, maybe they go into the wild card next year. But even then, you've got the AFC West that's not going to be any easier than it is yeah. this year. And everything else, I I just don't see it. I think that I think Denver made a huge mistake this offseason. And nobody identified that. There were folks that said, yeah. all right, they gave up too much. The Seahawks won the trade. And probably people in Seattle in the shadows. But right. nobody foresaw this thing being completely inept. And it's it's so strange. Uh, so Zach Wilson, you wouldn't you wouldn't be interested in even with a stock at its lowest. You just so no. that would mean that a lot of draft scouts, that's their job, their primary only job, got hoodwinked. Yeah, I I just don't see it with him. He he just doesn't have that same. It's 
it doesn't even come down to necessarily the stats or anything. It's just that it factor that you go <laughs> out on Sunday, you watch the game and you're like, I don't, I just don't trust this guy to make big throws in key situations. And he, he hasn't done it throughout his entire career. He doesn't have a single game in his career with three touchdown passes yet, which is <laughs> something Mike White has already done for the Jets <laughs> in just four games. So yeah, I just, I just don't see it. And maybe he, he's probably going to end up being a career backup. Like let's just face it at this point. Like I don't, it sounds a lot I like Josh Rosen. It it does. Yeah. And that's, that's the exact comparison that I'd make at this point is yeah. I, I think he's going to, I think he's going to be the next sort of Josh Rosen where we went into the draft. He had a lot of flashy stats at BYU. He got protected by one of the best offensive lines in college that we've ever seen. Yeah. And he kind of hoodwinked everybody. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with the, with the Wilsons. <laughs> <laughs> if he does follow that career wave of length, that means somebody will did Rosen went for a second rounder to the dolphins, right? I think or was so, it a yeah. third? Yeah, that means that Wilson will probably, <clears throat> assuming that they don't just do a reset and get him good for next year, um, that means that he would probably. And then what the draft pick won't be quite as good. Or did they steal a draft pick from somebody? Um, are they in the top I, ten? I, honest, I they I think they are in the top ten again. I can't remember which team it is, okay. but I I do remember. I think they are somewhere up there, right? 49ers, now. maybe. Okay. We'll it might to... it might be the Niners. We'll pull it up. All right. So well, here's our usual little montage. We'll be back on Wednesday of next week to talk about the 10 and 2 Vikings or the 9 and 3 Vikings. And actually, if it's the 9 and 3 Vikings, that one will feel a little bit sour because you lost at yeah. home to Mike White. There won't be any way to dress that one up, but neither one of us foresee that happening. Any closing arguments, sir? Uh let's go get another win and let's come to this division. Yeah, and then like you said, the the gauntlet here forward. I mean, Jets, Lions, Colts, Giants, probably the Jordan Love Packers, probably the Trevor Simeon Bears. There is a there's a two. there's a way to get to. Also, they're gonna they're gonna be the Vikings in one of those games. There's a way to get to fourteen yeah. and three. <laughs> um, yeah, and then all one thing I observed, and this is longer. This show's longer than normal. Hopefully, folks are still sticking around even after my uh, Wilson's brothers complete. You know, left fielder, no good. Uh, is that the Vikings have a two game lead on the 49ers. and mm-hmm. they have a was it four game lead on the Buccaneers? Tampa. Yeah, yeah. So. If you assume that they're probably not going to catch the Eagles, the tiebreaker and everything, you want to keep that two games at a distance from the 49ers because we all know that their roster, there's prob- they're probably better than the Vikings, let's face it. Um, yeah. the better def- Pretty much better everything besides quarterback than the Vikings. And even people would debate that Jimmy's more of a winner than Kirk. So right now at that 9-2 and two versus 7-4, and four, you want to keep that there because there's always a chance the Eagles get upended in the divisional round. And then therefore, the two seed, the NFC Championship, in theory, would go through U.S. Bank Stadium. But because the 49ers have gotten so much recent hype from the McCaffrey trade, I've kind of just assumed that they're nipping at the heels of the Vikings. They are, but they're not in terms of seeding. So, so long as the Vikings don't have gaffes like the Cowboys game, all they really have to do is keep that distance. Cause right now they have the same tie break divisional record. I think it's six and two for both teams. Yep. Yep. So yeah, keep that two seed. Yep. Give <laughs> boo 49ers the rest. Of, and they actually have a pretty challenging oh, yeah. schedule, a lot more challenging right. than the Vikings. So, all right, sir, we'll be back next Wednesday. That's all we got. Skull baby. See ya.